Hello, everyone, and welcome to Crucible Radio, the podcast for all things Destiny PvP. So you're probably listening, and you're wondering what happened to those minisodes I told you about last week. Okay, so they were recorded. They definitely happened. But Birds messaged me, and he said that he really wanted to go all out with this radio play. So we took a little more time to finish it up, and now you're going to hear it in its full glory this week. And uh, don't worry, Swain's segment is coming up, and next week we'll be coming at you with a full episode of Crucible Radio like usual. And there's a lot to talk about, because we've got the dawning, you know, Icebreaker is coming back, everyone has told me, everyone has reminded me. And I really want to break down this awesome new 4v4 meta that developed during the PvP Legends tournament this weekend. Uh, Fallout and I had a blast shoutcasting it and and watching it sort of materialize before our faces. Uh, That was so cool, so be sure to check out the highlights of that on the Planet Destiny YouTube channel. So we'll get to the action here soon, and I'm going to do the plugs at the beginning just to mix it up. So if you've never stayed till the end of the episode, this might be new. Which And and, and hey, stay listen to the whole thing, man. Uh, But if you want to up your game, be sure to use that offer code CRUCIBLE for some control freaks. I'm never lying when I say that they're awesome. Everything is much more comfortable. Uh, That's offer code CRUCIBLE. And we've got a few big announcements for the show coming up. Get ready next week. Those will all be happening. Uh, Until then, be sure to head over to CrucibleRadio.com if you want to hear more episodes. And give us a rating on iTunes if you like the show. That always means a lot to us. Okay, sorry. I love you guys. Thank you for being patient with us. Uh, if you are if you were waiting that for that stuff, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Swain, who's going to chat a bit and answer some listener questions. And after that, a reading of The Towers Fall. And I'm going to tell you, it sounds really great if you've got some good headphones. And I know a lot of you are traveling and listening to the car, so make sure you can crank it up a little bit. Sounds really, really cool. Uh, All right, let's do it. This is Crucible Radio. Hey, everybody. Swain here. And for my section of the podcast this week, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to be talking a little bit about how November is a very important month to me. And I'm also going to answer some fan questions uh, that we took on our Twitter and in the Slack. So uh, let's start a little bit about November. Uh, not typically known for much outside of uh, Thanksgiving here in the U.S. and mustaches. Uh, very familiar with mustaches. But Uh, I've typically used the month of November as kind of a reset button every year. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, oh, why don't you do this in January when everybody does it? I don't know. Something different about November to me. But uh, if there's something I don't like about myself or a bad habit I can't break, I try and focus on changing that about myself in the month of November. It's just one of those things that helps me feel better about achieving goals is looking back and saying, Hey, I started on November 1st. I can sit, look back and be like, hey, this is the start date. This is how long I've been doing it. And this is how long I've been focusing on myself. So I started focusing on one thing a year, kind of like just quitting soda or keeping my kitchen clean at home or volunteering with friends and so on. But as time went on, I would try more and more things each month. While not always successful, I always focused on myself. Much like how this podcast started, for Destiny, uh, I liked focusing on improving myself and helping others do so as well. This year, I figured I would give it a name and go all out. I called it November Better, and I shared it with everyone on my Twitter and in the Slack. I came up with a channel, started talking about it, getting everybody hyped for their own goals, kind of create a, a space where people could talk about what they're working on. Uh, the plan was to give up soda and energy drinks again. Ugh. These are my bane. Uh, I decided to give coffee another shot because I feel like that was a good substitute for drinking the energy energy drinks. Um, I also wanted to get back into the gym groove, shave my head, and embrace my inner Viking. And uh, finally go back to streaming more often. Uh, I love playing Destiny, and I love playing Destiny with our fans. And that's something I wanted to get back into it, especially after the long period of time. Uh, I spent planning the wedding and getting ready for that, so it's nice to be back. I decided I would make some very lofty goals and some easy goals, uh, just so that if I did reach those lofty ones, I would feel really good about myself, but I would always achieve those small, attainable goals. So, now that it's approaching almost the end of November, 
I feel like I should have probably done this at the beginning, but what can you do? Uh, how am I doing? Uh, well, life always seems to find a way to interrupt your plans. There's always something that happens. There's an event to do or something pops up or, you know, something uh, you know, bad happens. But you got to keep chugging on. So I'm doing pretty good for how November is going. Uh, I've been soda and energy drink free all month. I have even found ways to ingest coffee that doesn't want to make me bark. I've been back to streaming and it's been great seeing all these people coming around, watch me go around the crucible, play with the Vex Smith class, you know, the, the normal. While I'm still looking for a schedule that fits my busy life for streaming, I'm enjoying the hell out of it. And I appreciate everyone that stopped by. Uh, the gym has probably been the slowest start for me. But just this past week, I've been going pretty consistently and have been focusing on eating better, which is always good. This is the base on which I will build the rest of my year. From here on out, I hope that changing these things will help me be better at doing all the other things, kind of like a trickle-down effect. So I will strive to better myself every day, and I suggest you guys too. Uh, if you have any of these goals that you want to do, please hit me up on Twitter. Tell me how you're doing. Tell me what you want to focus on, what you want to better yourself, even if it's like a top three in the Crucible or a top three in your real life. Let me know. I'm there for you. Speaking of on Twitter, uh, we asked you guys some questions, and I figured I would answer some of them, and maybe even answer some, you know, <laughs> uh, controversial ones, something that we don't normally do. So, our first question is from fellow podcaster Mercules. He asks, "How many times a week do people accuse you of being bungee shills?" Uh, I would say probably daily. Um, it feels that way especially when you have a show that focuses on the crucible, such a controversial topic for a lot of people and especially being level headed and focusing on improvement sounds like we don't care a lot to a lot of people. Trust me, we care. Uh, next one, uh, cheese and taters asks, what's your favorite kind of ice cream? And y'all know I love food questions. So, uh, my favorite ice cream is peanut butter world by Ben and Jerry's and it's only sold at target. So if you have target near you, Go grab some, especially if you like peanut butter. Next one is from Death Ray Dino. They ask, what's a skill that your co-hosts have that you want to have or are currently working on? Birds, I would say, is really good at Excel, and I really want that for, I mean, I use Excel for work, but I would love to be much better at it. Uh, and Bones is crazy good at swapping weapons in the Crucible and just being fine. You know, oh, I'll just use this today or switch to this. And, oh, there's a no land beyond my vault. Oh, I'm going to pull that out and be really good at that, too. It's uh, infuriating at times. Next up, uh, we have Judge Nemo. They ask, how has your perception of the community changed from yourselves going from unknowns to celebrities? I feel like celebrities is kind of a strong word, but Nemo asked it. Uh, I would say back before I started on the show, uh, I was just like a lot of other people. Uh, I still am like a lot of other people. Uh, just doing my thing in the Crucible. I was getting angry at the meta. I refused to use Thorn out of some weird, you know, moral, you know, moral grounds. Uh, and I would be like doing Crota, trying to solo Crota. So, um, but having met all of these great Crucible minds and talked to so many different members of the community from all different skill levels on the show and like in the Slack or on Twitter, uh, I feel like I've changed a lot. Uh, I've realized that if I focus on these things too much, I won't improve. And when I stopped, my abilities in the Crucible grew exponentially. So if you think I suck now, uh, imagine how bad I sucked <laughs> way long ago. So I see this improvement in, in myself and I want so many others to see that all it takes is this change that will help you get better in the Crucible. I think it's unfortunate when people get so caught up in it, you know, all the bad in the game that they see, uh, and it affects them adversely. Now, I love y'all, <laughs> but some of you need to work on your tilt issues, and I hope I can help you get that better. Uh, Monkey Toe uh, asks, Quick, the tower is burning down, and you have to grab the primary, secondary, and heavy you will use for the rest of your life. Uh, this one's kind of easy. 
uh, Mida, Praetorian Foil, and BTRD. I figured I couldn't run double exotics like this, so I would have picked Plan C. But uh, Daniel Stone Drum, good old Dan, asks stuffing with or without raisins or cranberries. Ew, Dan. Ew. No fruit and stuffing, please. That's why there's the the can shaped cranberry sauce. Next up, we have Adam of Shea. They ask, what safeguards do you all use to keep teammates from tilting? And when they do, what are some ways to bring them back down or up? Uh, This kind of goes with our other question and something I kind of learned as a chef. Um, Being angry and throwing a fit doesn't make you look good. No one thinks, hey, that guy is so angry and cool for acting that way. (laughs) Uh, Other people may not tell you this, but you look silly for acting this way. And no one really benefits from it. Uh, and there's really no simple and you know soft way to say this to your friends. But sometimes a sternly worded message like this kind of brings someone back down to earth. Um, but as far as keeping f- teammates from tilting, I kind of just like kind of keep a positive mindset and encourage people. You know, even if there's something good, like something bad happens, I like to say that, oh, this is a good round. Those are some good shots. We just need to clean this up. Address your problems openly and don't let them frustrate you. And Adam Mache also asks, and when can we expect Swain Nation shirts? Uh, that's up to Birds. He's in charge of uh, Swain Nation. So hopefully soon. PSN Jelly Billy asks, do you guys think Destiny has a player population problem, which is adding to the matchmaking problem? I would say possibly. I mean, numbers are never going to be as high as they are at like a re- release. So when Rise of Iron out came out, I'm sure there was a ton more players that were in the game. And that just drops off drastically as people finish the easy content. Uh, the people that come back and say, oh, Destiny got a new release. I'm going to play it, play all the PvE, maybe play some PvP. And then they just put it down and move on to the next game. There's plenty of games out right now. I'm sure plenty of people are playing other things. This could possibly be a, you know, a problem in this. There's not much of a pool to pull from. So it is tough to find new good games. Who knows? The only people that know would be Bungie. MK Nope asks, Will Swain Stash ever live stream himself cooking a meal in his kitchen in the style of Julia Child? Uh, I mean... Maybe one day. I didn't. Even, I didn't even really think about it. But if you want to see me cook? Let me know. Uh, these next few questions are from the Slack. H uh, four Motorsports asks, "Hey Swain, here's a question for the show. I often hear about guardians and fellow gamers listening to music while playing. Is that something you guys do? And if so, what kind of music sets the mood for you? So I have like this really flowy Spotify playlist that I have. Um, I got it from Six Trez." He's a community member. And it's just like, it's perfect. It's got like, it's got a lot of songs that like are just beats. There's some that have, you know, uh, lyrics and whatnot, but mostly it sticks to like pretty subtle, you know, flowy music. And this is something that I use casually. I don't like playing music when I'm playing Trials or the occasional sweat. I need to hear callouts and I kind of need a clear headspace to make callouts. Can't really have like much in my ear. So uh, sometimes it's also tough to do it while streaming too. So and on to the next one by Marquise 88. He says, name three things that you think should be for lack of a better word nerfed and three things you think should be buffed for an overall more balanced game. He also adds, for the record, I think the game is pretty balanced now, but there's always something to go for. Like I said, don't normally answer these questions because of the aforementioned reasons above, but I think this game, to me, is pretty balanced right now. Um, And that's because I'm probably in that average player, a little bit closer to the top, but I land in that middle of the, the pack area, and I feel like... In this group, there's people that are frustrated and they think that uh, <laughs> they, they personally think TTK is fast because shotguns and, you know, hand cannons. But in all reality, it, it was much faster. 
And it's tough to say right now, like, oh, it's benefiting me because my no, you know, my primary aim isn't that good um, compared to other gamers who might be much better at it. But anyway, here's my list of three things that I could see being changed and three I would love to see changed in, for the, my benefit. <laughs> Remember, this represents me personally and not everybody else in Crucible Radio. And it definitely doesn't mean it's coming from any like, oh, I've heard this from the community. This is what needs to happen. So here's my lists. Number one, I could see that high caliber rounds could be more consistent across all guns. Uh, We're seeing a lot of clever dragons right now. And I think that's cool that it was available. But I feel like high caliber rounds on clever dragon is a little bit more intense than on some other guns. Uh, I definitely miss it on Mida. But like I said, I think it could be a little bit more consistent across all guns as far as providing flinch. Number two, uh, I'm not opposed to seeing spawns swap in trials. Um, I think it would be pretty cool. Uh, after some of the changes they did rec- recently, I could see them trying it. Why not? Uh, but I'm pretty sure people would be upset about getting a certain starting side if they had spawn swapping. Be like, oh, I hate starting on, you know, A side on Rusted Lands. There's always going to be something to complain about. And number three is skip grenades. <laughs> Goddamn skip grenades. I don't know. This personally affects me. I don't know. I feel like I'm always running away from skip grenades forever. So I, I want them to go away. And then for things I personally would want buffed, uh, for making it a little bit balanced for me. Uh, Titan Melee. Obviously, uh, we got those short T-Rex arms. While I do like playing Sunbreaker with the melee for laughs when I punch someone off a map, uh, I, could, I would love just a little bit more range. Just a little bit more range. That's all I ask. Uh, number two would be to bring back all of the exotics that are left. Uh, we are talking about Vex Mythoclast. Uh, Icebreaker, Icebreaker in its original form would be nice. But I think uh, if we get to those last few days of Destiny 1, uh, bringing out the ridiculousness and having a little bit of silly fun would be would be something that this community could use. And number three is uh, a matchmaking issue. Uh, not so much skill versus connection, but Oh, it may be one of those things. I just want full lobbies again. And we talked a little bit about it before and how, who knows? It could be a small player base. It could be connections aren't good enough around me or something. But I've consistently been playing dailies where I'm playing in like a 4v6 or immediately load in and it's like 5v4. And it's just frustrating, especially in like a game mode like Supremacy. Go to play Supremacy, and it doesn't fill out for the entire match. And as a team of four, going up with a team of six, we're constantly down. And there's no way for us to get back, especially in such like a game mode like that. So I've got many things that I like, dislike about the Crucible, and I like about the Crucible, but complaining about it is not getting me anywhere. And hoping and making wish listing. Uh, it's just that. It's wishlisting. I don't work at Bungie, and I can't influence them to change these things if the data shows otherwise or the player feedback shows otherwise. Who knows? Um, But I'll keep moving forward. I'll keep playing the way I have, and hopefully you know, some nice changes come along, and I'll adapt to those. So there you go. And our last one, last question of the day, is from Northwest Hansen. They ask... What is your go-to gas station snack? <laughs> this is kind of funny because now that I live a certain now that I live a certain amount away from work, I drive in pretty often, and I always grab these like tasty cake, which is like a local Philly thing. Uh, they're crunchy donuts. They're like real small, kind of like a little bit, probably like a half dollar sized donuts, but they're so good. And I eat like all six of them on my way to work with like a soft pretzel and a water. Um, 
Definitely not the best breakfast, but like you said, go to gas station snack. That's what I've been grabbing lately. That's it for questions, people. Um, I very much enjoyed this uh, small segment I got to do this week. It's kind of fun to do it a little bit different than we normally do. I do miss the guys, and uh, hopefully they say some nice things about me. Uh, Yeah, we're going to move on to Bones. Hey, y'all. Bones here. So I was playing Trials on Rusted Lance, and I ran a ticket to the lighthouse using not like the others, the Vanguard Scout Rifle from Year 2, which I talk about on this show constantly. I love it. And it really kind of brought a unique happiness that I hadn't expected using that gun that I had spent so much time with and that I really loved. And it made me happy to remember that we have these relics and these items and these little personal memories that no one else gets in this game, but we keep them with us for a a year, if not longer. And that was really cool. But it started to make me think about how much time we have left to go to the next big thing or for the rest of whatever this destiny journey is for us. And I I think it's important that we keep in mind that we might not get the next best thing for a little while. And, you know, we might get bored. We might go crazy. Who knows? But we got to, you know, brace for that. That being said, in the meantime, I thought maybe to get us excited, to cheer us up a little bit, uh, I would share the story I wrote which is sort of my imagination of what could happen in the sequel. I have all these ideas of where the plot could go, what we might do, what kind of uh, locations we might visit more on Mercury or new planets, that kind of thing. But this is what I sort of saw as like a cool way to to kick off the sequel uh, in whatever form that may be. So uh, hopefully my voice acting is is uh, okay enough. Kermit does not show up. I feel more confident doing Kermit than I do some of the Destiny characters. But uh, without further ado, this is my imagining of the sequel to Destiny. Green banners waved in the breeze as crimson leaves shuffled, a reminder to Tower residents that Earth still retained beauty and serenity within a dangerous universe. Laughter echoed through the Hall of Guardians, a rare moment of joy between the prickly vanguard leaders. Hunters stood in lines by the vaults as they struggled to choose which cloak they must dismantle, while warlocks traded war stories in the cantina, unaware of the eye rolls cast their way by titans nearby. Typical moments from a typical day above the last city. The white-haired but youthful merchant Tess Everest finished a transaction at her post facing out over the city where the traveler hung still, eternally restful. A particularly raucous and mismatched flock of birds came careening over the railing, something Tess wasn't used to seeing. Very few species of fowl ever bothered to fly up to her perch atop the tower. As Tess stepped out of her stall and made her way towards the railing to follow the birds as they bickered, A gust of wind shook the banners that stood proudly as a representation of humanity's last stand. Tess felt odd and cold. The wind was always crisp at this altitude, but as another gust picked up and the birds screeched and dove out of sight, it became clear to Tess that they weren't bickering. They were moving with some other purpose. Fleeing. The air became colder still, and Tess looked skyward to see a rippling blue streak of energy cut through the sky above. It vanished before she could confirm what she had seen, but it was enough. The skiff appeared before the words escaped her mouth. Dropship! As Tess turned and ran towards the stairway leading down to the Hall of Guardians, more skiff apparated into the sky, appearing after flashes of energy as they warped in close to the tower's rooftop platform. Then, a boom, and a catch began materializing, still high above but sailing towards the landing. Tower patrons came to the windows and gasped in horror. Vendors fled their posts and followed in Tess's hurried footsteps. Terrified civilians cried out as guardians tried frantically to gather and protect everyone in sight. The invasion had come so suddenly, no time to prepare. Whatever happened to just getting some rest? The ghost floated to and fro near the doorway of the small apartment. It was a cramped but sparse room, clearly hinting that its occupant rarely spent much time there. Along one wall hung sets of warlock armor, one reminiscent of the Vex, another infested with the Siva virus, the others of Hive origin. 
all had seen battle. On the thin bed sat a warlock. Underneath faded war paint, his eyes were tired and red. The ghost floated closer and twisted and turned in his usual, quizzical way, analyzing the warlock whom with he had spent every moment over the past three years. Whatever happened to just enjoying yourself? The two had seen more than anyone in the universe could say since they first became inseparable on that fateful afternoon in the Cosmodrome. It never needed to be said, but at this point, they were one unit. Neither would or could continue without the other. The ghost had seen the warlock in this mood enough to know exactly what he was thinking, but the conversation had grown tired. Is waiting such a bad thing? The warlock looked down. On the floor at his feet laid a yellow and blue pulse rifle. It hadn't been fired in months, but had been held quite often. Whenever this powerful guardian found time to stop at his closet-sized home in the tower, I'm just ready for the next clue, he finally replied. Understood, but the Exo hasn't shown her face for a while. We've scoured every buried temple on Venus, killed enough fallen to wipe out a generation. It's time we turned our focus elsewhere. The ghost was sincere, but worried. It's time for the next step. I'm going crazy waiting around for something to happen. At this point, I'd be glad to experience real danger again. The ghost could only look down as ghosts do. Slowly at first, a low rumble could be heard coming from somewhere above them. The warlock and ghost looked at each other, then down at the rifle, which vibrated and slid across the floor as the apartment began to shake. Without another word, the ghost dematerialized, and the warlock was off. The sliding doors instantly parted in front of the warlock to reveal a tower platform void of any life. Dust filled the air and stung his eyes as he adjusted to the light, looking outward at a sky filled with a fallen catch and more skiff than he could count. As he gazed out over the railing in shock, a large airship began to fill his vision. From mere meters in front of the tower, a second catch floated directly up and into view, its engines filling the air with a warm, electric energy that ripped the proud banners off their poles, throwing them against the far wall until they tore over the roof of the tower and out of sight. The roar of the ship mixed with the tower sirens caused him to buckle, experiencing sensory overload. As he caught his breath, he looked up to see the fallen troops drop down off the catch and onto the tower's surface, the first time he'd ever witnessed unwelcome visitors at his home. Still paralyzed by sheer amazement, the warlock observed a Kestrel-class AX careening wildly towards him, its back engines engulfed in flame. Crashing forcefully into the postmaster's stand, he watched with wide eyes as it exploded a few feet in front of him. Move, Guardian, grumbled a deep and raspy voice. The warlock was shoved towards the central steps by a firm hand, and he didn't turn around until halfway down the staircase when a defensive shield flew over their heads and sealed them inside. Turning, he was face to face with Banshee 44, the cantankerous gunsmith. What's happening? asked the warlock, not knowing what kind of answer he expected. The end, replied Banshee. Just like that, the gunsmith headed down a corridor, cut off by a closing door, exiting as quickly as he had entered. The warlock debated pursuing him only for a second, but soon realized he was now surrounded by hundreds of panicked and alarmed tower vendors, guardians, and citizens. Make your way towards the emergency exits. Citizens of the tower, it is imperative that you cooperate to ensure that all of us make it out alive. Guardians, arm yourselves and prepare for battle. Commander Zavala's booming and steady voice echoed, The tried-and-true leader of Titans stood on the vanguard's table looking out over the frantic crowd. At his feet, Ikora Ray, Master Warlock, worked frantically at her station to gather what information she needed and eliminate the rest. The look on her face betrayed her thoughts. She wasn't planning on returning to this haven anytime soon and wasn't about to let the Fallen find what they came for. Bang. Bang. The Fallen were above them. Deeper into the Hall of Guardians, Crucible Quartermaster Arcida9940 stood at his usual spot, only now his weapons are free of charge. Guardians stood round, handing out auto rifles and shotguns back through the crowd behind them, ensuring that everyone would be equipped to face whatever was smashing down the doors at that very moment. Cade 6 leaned against Arcida's stand, spinning the cylinder on Ace of Spades and loading it with ammo. Ever the professional, he remained calm and collected, somehow relaxed. Arcida noticed the gun. Cade! Are you not a vanguard? Surely you don't plan on participating in the fight? He took an extra second to respond. No, of course not. And gave the chamber one final spin before handing it off to a young hunter, who looked up in surprise as the legendary fighter walked away. Bang. Bang. The security doors wouldn't hold much longer. It is of the essence that we move quickly. 
Make your way to the lower hangars and to the base of the tower. There was no fight here. We are vacating. Boomed Zavala, who finally hopped down from the table and prepared for his own exit. The warlock pushed against the current of the crowd and approached the table. Are we ready to defend ourselves? His tone was urgent. There is no defense today, Guardian. Their numbers are too great, replied Zavala, not looking up at the soldier he had relied on so heavily over the past years. All due respect, Commander, but we have faced much... He couldn't finish before the Madam Vanguard interjected. No chance, Warlock. We should have seen this coming, but we did not. We are to retreat to the exterior base at once. The tower is lost, said Ikora, and she meant it. The Warlock paused before finally replying, I'll buy us time. Commander Zavala finally looked up. He glanced over the Warlock's shoulder with a concerned look, then... You are valuable to our war. I shouldn't have to remind you of that. If you don't make it out of here alive... I see little hope for our future. It was perhaps the biggest compliment Zavala had ever given another living being, and the warlock realized the profundity of that statement immediately, as did Cade, who stifled a metallic cough in his surprise. Feeling bolstered, the guardian turned without a word as his ghost materialized over his shoulder. You really are looking for an adventure, aren't you? The glowing light quipped. Behind him, the large table surrounded by the vanguard split into two and opened down its length, revealing a staircase that led below the Hall of Guardians. Without wasting any more time, Ikora Ray, Cade Six, and Zavala made their way down the steps, swallowed by the table as it resumed its original form. Bang. 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 Steadfast, the warlock observed the hall in front of him, now barren, the wall stripped of weapons. He reminisced for a moment on the countless armies he had single-handedly eliminated, but in the silence, the desperation felt by everyone who had gone below finally hit him. This was real, and this was happening. The tower would fall this day. Bang. 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 The security doors crumbled against an unseen brute force, and immediately down the steps poured a clacking and screeching army of dregs and vandals. A scout rifle materialized in the warlock's hands as his finger subconsciously latched onto the trigger before not like the others had even solidified. The moment it did, he fired. Dreg heads began popping as the expert marksman became one with his weapon, every bullet a confirmed kill. Reloading in a flash, the onslaught continued, but Dreg bodies created quickly growing piles left and right. Vandals ducked and weaved but were still met with ammunition that struck them down before they made it more than a few meters down the hall. The warlock advanced as he fired, moving calmly and intentionally towards the wave that bore down on him. The first wave slimmed but grew closer as more vandals pushed forward with their blades drawn and shining. As the closest vandal leaped, the warlock almost invisibly withdrew his shotgun and put shell upon shell into the sword-bearing fallen soldiers, their bodies flying backwards, bowling over unfortunate drags who stood in their paths. From his palm came an orb of void energy, splitting off into particles that tracked down vandals behind cover, exploding and vaporizing them into purple sparks. Vandals that got too close to the warlock were met with a flash as he sent them into nothingness with the powerful force of his melee. This was his element. This was what he was meant to do. Blood and body parts flooded the room, riddled with bullets, but all the Guardian could see was the radiating light that burned inside of him and propelled him forward sharpening his senses. There was no thought, only action. The fallen bore down but could not harm him. He was unstoppable. From out of sight at the top of the stairs came a low, animalistic grumble. A few more rounds from his scout finished off the last of the wave. Then the guardian reloaded and readied himself for the approaching threat. Down the stairs and into the hall stepped a menacing fallen kell cloaked in black with asymmetric spikes and horns protruding from his head and shoulders. His left eye was gone from its socket, his right burned black. As his cloak billowed, the warlock attempted to catch its insignia, but the fallen symbol was completely foreign to him. This was not a kell of the house of devils, or kings, or wolves. The warlock shook off the confusion quickly, regaining his confident composure. Ghost, do you think we've got enough room to fire off a horn in here? I don't know if I recommend. Too late. A shining iron galahorn appeared on the warlock's shoulder, and with a howl, a rocket shot through the Hall of Guardians towards the Kell, who continued his steady approach. Just as the projectile was about to find its target, the Kell held up a clawed hand and formed a... space. It wasn't void. It wasn't energy. 
It was just dark. A small space in which nothing existed or could exist in the palm of its hand. The rocket approached and in an instant disappeared, followed by a deep cackle. The warlock swallowed, and then the Kel spoke. You are the guardian who has sent legions running. The guardian who has struck fear into the hearts of hive gods and disrupted the unending path of the Vex. Nearly struck speechless, but summoning all the courage he could muster, the Guardian replied, Some even say I have become legend. Your story ends here. A powerful darkness has come to blot out the light of the Traveler. Without waiting for a response, the Dark Kel summoned a jagged and twisted blade, gripping the heavy weapon with both upper arms and moved forward, bearing down upon the Warlock. Out of options, the Guardian planted his feet, holding tight to his rocket launcher, but bracing for the worst. Raising the blade above his head, the Kel aimed to strike down, moving with the force of a guillotine. With a heavy clang, the blade struck an ancient iron shield, held firm by an imposing titan with a broken horned helmet. Lord Shax took the full force of the blow on his shoulder as he hoisted one of the shields he ripped from the wall. Move! Now! Regaining his senses, the warlock clambered to his feet and sprinted for the windows on the far end of the hall. Under the strain of the Kel, Lord Shaq spun out from underneath with a fist rippling in arc energy aimed for the Kel's jaw. Caught off guard, the fallen leader staggered back, only to retaliate with a fury. Shaq's back pedaled, trading blows, shield to sword, until the mighty relic was torn from his hands, skittering across the floor. But the titan wasted no time, heading towards the warlock with hurried strides. From the Guardian's hands came a glowing purple light as he hurled a cascade of void energy at the windows, shattering them just seconds before they leaped into the sky. Landing on a balcony nearly a hundred yards beneath the windows, the Warlock and Shax both caught their breath. Rushing to the railing, they looked out at a sea of transport ships hurrying away from the tower in a mass exodus. On the ground, Guardians young and old fought off an onslaught of fallen troops that had approached from within the city. Looking back up at the window from which they had jumped, the warlock equipped his scout rifle, but a heavy hand clamped down on his shoulder. Fight forever, Guardian, but not here. The warlock nodded, finally accepting defeat. Looking out over their home, for what could be the final time, the city's last defenders sighed as they dematerialized while their ships passed quickly over their heads. The two fighter-class vessels jetted off after the transport vehicles, the last of humanity's chance, now on the run.